Okay, let's get started. This is the first lecture of the Java EE course, lecture number one. What I'm going to do is survey the EE platform, talk about and define a lot of these technologies that we're going to look at uh, over the next uh, 15 weeks or so. I'm based off Java 2 Enterprise Edition. Um, background knowledge. What are you going to need to know for the course? This is kind of a repeat of what I just went over with the syllabus. But you don't have to be a Java expert. You don't actually need to know about object-oriented programming either, but a few Java skills would come in handy. It's not necessary to understand the different packages. Just knowing how to program in Java is a bare minimum, I would hope. Um, also, you want to have some experience with relational databases. You don't have to be an expert at that either. A lot of you probably already took my database course. That would be perfect prerequisite if you have taken that. If you haven't taken it, to have any sort of undergraduate course in uh, databases is going to be helpful because once we start using JDBC, if you don't know what a table is, you don't know what a query is, you can't write a query, you're going to be sort of stuck. Uh, and then you're learning how to write SQL queries and create tables while you're performing the JDBC connection. You know, it's just, um, it's just helpful. And not a huge requirement if your background is sort of sketchy. If it is sketchy, I recommend picking up a database book. Uh, and if you're a computer science or a software engineer or student, you're going to want to have database background anyway. It's kind of like a core requirement these days because every application uses a database to some extent. That's a basic understanding on how to execute transactions using SQL. Uh, how is your Java background? Hmm, do we need to review some basics? Well, we're not going to, I've kind of made an executive decision and said I'm not going to do it for this course. In the past, I've, when I've taught this course, I've spent the first couple of weeks going over Java, and then I've realized it's not enough to do those people any justice, and then the other people are extremely bored, the ones who have taken the Java programming course. So I'm not going to do it this time. Instead, I have those lectures up there that I just showed you in the, in the introduction for 1, 2, and 3 for Java, how to program in Java. So what we're looking at why you're here in this particular course is this is the hottest, latest, greatest technology changes in terms of the EE background, EE programming. Uh, experience in EE will hopefully give you a better, ex, you know, extremely marketable skills, hopefully. It will give you a better chance in internships and things of that nature and consultancies and stuff like that because everybody wants to know if you have any EE background. So the purpose of the course is to give you a wide background in these technologies. And so it's not a bad idea to start out with application servers. Uh, so what is it? A server. So it's similar to a web server. Provides middle tier logic to enterprise applications. Hence Java EE, Enterprise Edition. We're creating enterprise applications. Gave you sort of a brief definition of the concept of an enterprise in the introduction. But just to review it a little bit, we're talking about not like the Starship Enterprise, Star Trek, you know, with Captain Kirk, but it's kind of like that. Yeah. Star, you know, actually, believe it or not, Star Trek, the Starship Enterprise, <laughs> the fleet is a fleet. There's many of those, and they're all working together and communicating with each other and helping each other out. You know, they always call in, they call in for backup help. It's kind of like the police force, kind of works like an enterprise in some ways where they're working in a networked kind of environment together, all for the same purpose, all for the same objective. So in a Java perspective, take it out of Star Trek, put it into programming, what we're really talking about is using multiple servers and putting applications, separating the applications out onto an application server that is connected to a web server on the front end. And then the application server might be connected to other servers, like a database server or special file access servers or different types of applications and things that are all located all over. And we build the enterprise by the connectivity that's created between all of these different servers. And uh, that connectivity gives us the enterprise, essentially, by definition. So you do more than just serve up web pages and provide middle layer support for web applications. Application servers are quite functional these days. They're computing environments in their own essentially. So here's some examples. We have a web page with a simple submit button. This is what we'll see with the JSP environment as we build that. That invokes a Perl script or maybe a Java class. Could be served by a web server. And then we're into that N tier sort of. <coughs> the, N, the letter N is in Nancy. N tier for any number 
of tiers. If we multi-tier it, usually the web server is the front end. Usually the web server would be, and when I say front end, back end, these are the terms that I'm going to be using throughout the course. On the front end, we're, this is what's interfacing with the customer, with the client who's connecting. You know, if we're thinking of this sort of like a client server environment, the web web tier web server is the server from the perspective of the user or the client. Behind it, we have the back end, and the back end is more secure. It's not open to the public. It's only connected through the web server. Web server's first interface is generally what's called the application server on this previous side. So web server connects with application server. Application server connects backwards to, and it's behind. It's, if you kind of visually line it all up like dominoes, we got the web is the first domino. <laughs> Second one's the application server. Third one is going to be probably database server of some sort. Or actually, back around the third or fourth server in this chain of dominoes, they start not and not essentially lining up behind each other, but now they're in parallel. So we have a big wall that basically exists with all of these different special purpose sort of uh, things. So if the Java class used data from the enterprise database, which might be Oracle, and don't worry if you're not familiar with Oracle or MySQL, it doesn't really matter. If you're familiar with some database, um, it would be appropriate uh, to be have some background at all. But if you don't have a background in client server type databases, you've only used you know, Microsoft Access or something. You can still get through the course just fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but most uh, enterprise-wide databases would be Oracle, MySQL. They're shared by other applications. So you have one database server that connects with all of the different application servers, hopefully, in the company. So this class may be better implemented in an application server rather than in a web server. So knowing where in the tiering to actually implement desired functionality is part of the class as well, part of the, you know, this particular class. So we know what kind of you know, protection we want for it, how we're going to better connect it. Because after you assemble the pieces together, the goal is to have an extensible system that can be expanded or it can be shrunk down. And then we can also provide protection for certain things and we can provide connectivity. So a big part of it is creating that enterprise. So application server and technology, the various levels of technology that exist are within the application server itself. And this is where I was, I've already mentioned the N tier, usually N tier meaning that many different transparent client server relationships working together to form uh, the single application. So we don't really we don't really sense the client server sort of um, environment. It's kind of transparent in a lot of ways. In fact, um, you may not even call it a client server. You might call it a distributed environment. So if you've got some sort of a networking background, taken a networking class before, you don't really have to have it for this class, but it is nice to know the differences between client server distributed and you know, stuff like that. And a client server normally, the, well, the modern day, and the, the definitions have kind of transformed a little bit throughout the last 10 years or so. Traditionally, everything was client server. We had servers, we had one server, two servers, and we had thousands of clients. And the clients sort of created this star topology. Where the server sat in the middle, if you can imagine it, and all the clients connected to it. And it looked like a big old star with the brightest point in the middle, which was the server. Now with the internet, we have more servers. <laughs> we have server, server, server. And we have servers that are connected together with each other. And then we have clients that act like servers and servers that act like clients to other servers. And then what we've done is we've separated out and distributed applications over multiple servers. When we start spreading things out instead of having single standalone servers, now we have a group of servers that work together. And we have fallen into the modern day definition of distributed computing. And that really started out with Unix, essentially. Unix was the first distributed slash client server type of network. And the entire internet is Unix, essentially. It's all Unix servers connected together. So long story short, we have a distributed slash client server network <laughs> on the internet. And the enterprise is building using the internet as a foundation. So naturally we're going to be seeing and using both kind of terminologies. HTTP servers, if you've taken a web development class, you know about those, serving up HTML pages. We're going to actually 
use HTTP servers to house Java J, JV, Java Bean servers, um, servlet servers, to mix and match technologies, which is why this class is kind of interesting, actually, because you know, going back to this comment about the HTTP servers, which I kind of made, everything has got to run through an HTTP web server. How does it get to the customer? How does the customer actually? Well, they're going through a web app. Or they're going through a you know a web browser. They're going through Internet Explorer, Firefox, or something. Well, that's the HTTP interface through the server. You're going to serve up beans. You're going to serve up servlets, the JSP pages, which is equivalent to ASP. If you're familiar with that or any of the ASP.NET technologies, I'm not going to cover any of that because that's the Microsoft side of things, and this is Java. But it's the same concept in that we're mixing the technology from a client end to a server end, and we're running it on the server, which is a lot safer and a lot more quick. You know, it's quicker, and more efficient than running things on the client. And in the old days, before any of this existed, if we wanted to actually run an application through HTTP, you know, we we could run a script, we could run create an applet as an example. If you were to just talk about Java for a second, and the client would actually download this applet and would run on the client machine. Purposes of the enterprise environment is run it all off of the server, run everything. Nothing gets run on the client. If we do that, then we can have what's called thin clients, and thin clients are the cell phones, the iPads, you know, tablets, and things that don't have a lot of processing power. Well, actually, they have a lot more than they used to, but they traditionally don't have as much processing power as a full-fledged computer. They don't have as much hard drive space. Um, you know, they have graphics and they have memory, minimal amount of memory, but the idea is to make it so it's minimal requirements, put everything on the server, then you can really run some sophisticated applications in an EE environment. So JDBC is the first technology we're going to look at. It's the J Java database connectivity, um, where we're going to provide connectivity to debate databases through classes that we're going to create. And uh, it, it's hard to find an application these days that does not use the database. Everybody uses databases for everything. It's like 99.9% .9 of all applications out there. JDBC works with Oracle, works with MySQL, works with practically any and every server database. And we're going to see it in sort of a server application development environment. JNDI enables you to find other components within the enterprise system. We're going to talk about the technology. You're not necessarily going to have to implement a JNDI kind of uh, application. It's almost too easy. You know, you'll, you'll see how the technology itself and how you can configure the components to find each other. And the, name, the naming convention and the lookup is kind of straightforward. But we will be creating a JDBC application. You're also going to be creating a servlet application as well and using JSP uh, as in correlation with it or along with it, I should say. So servlets, Java's answer to the traditional CGI. Anybody actually work with CGI before? Heard of CGI? Uh, no? <laughs> Common gateway interface? See, there was life before Java. <laughs> Actually, this was like one of the most best things that have ever been invented, if you think about it. Uh, so CGI, uh, stay connected, be persistent with servers between different calls. Well, okay, what happened? We wrote an H, everything has always been HTTP through HTTP protocol. So the HTTP channel created a gateway into a separate directory, kind of hidden, sort of protected the CGI bin, you know, held executable files. <coughs> CGI allowed clients to run executable files written in C++, written in Perl, written in non-internet applications, run stuff on the server through this open door gateway. <laughs> so one problem is, is each thread that came through created its own process on the server, ran its own version of the executable file, and took up server resources. You know, maybe if it's a small little script, if it's a small little executable, not going to notice. If it's something big, like a connection to the database, server number one connects, goes through CGI, runs a script, opens up a session <coughs> with the database. Client number two does that. Client number three does that. How many times are we only going to have three clients? We have millions of people on the internet accessing these applications. Easy to take the database down. You know, how many simultaneous connections can you support on a database application? 
depends on the traffic, I guess. But long story short, very slow. The more people, the more clients that are connected, extremely slow, extremely inefficient. But it does allow you, and it's still around today, still around because it does allow you to run non-internet applications that way. You know, regular C++ code, regular C code. Um, so it still has a purpose. Uh, but what Java did in terms of the servlet is it created this ability to make one instance of one object, which is where we have the remote invocation of object, which is kind of a different concept. But let me talk about that first, RMI. So we know about running Java programs on our local computer, hopefully. <laughs> so <laughs> we have class files, and we make instances of objects, and they're locally on our computer. Well, RMI, which is not on the slide here, and it's a slight tangent, because it, but it leads into the servlet concept, uh, is remote invocations. So what you're doing is you're running, you're connecting to a server and you're using an instance of an object that's already created on that server and you're connecting with that object and communicating with it as if it was located on your your personal computer. So the servlet environment or server environment can make instances of objects and house them in sort of an object repository so that they can be shared among multiple connections, multiple clients, multiple applications. So if you've got to have the ability to serve up, which is the concept of the servlet, going back to this concept, is to create one instance of one object, have a manager that keeps track of all these instances, refreshes them when necessary, and controls the access to them and the usage of them and what, they're, what information they're sending out. And you've got a lot more control over the execution of that functionality. And you can really utilize the server resources a lot more efficiently. So instead of each client creating its own brand new process on the server to actually execute something, instead, they're coming in, they're sharing everything that's already there, and the server like, just serves it up, makes it available, gives it out, sort of like CGI. CGI is just a gateway, a door you went through. Server that's more of a managed environment server but it's smaller because it's not a full-fledged server it's just a well it's usually a directory you load the <laughs> you load the information in there and everything in there gets loaded up and gets ready to go and gets served out to everyone who connects to it uh, who's going to connect to it well not normally clients it's going to be application servers that are going to do that or it's going to be other part members of the tier that are going to come through and ask for stuff that's located in the servlet environment JSP, as a technology, runs from the client end. So if you've ever looked at the URL and you've seen, you know, hello world.jsp out there, <laughs> you're running a JSP file. Oh, it was JSP. It's a scripting language. It's um, the ability, and JSP works with the servlet, actually. Because JSP can go in and say, well, this object exists. Um, go to that instance of that object and give me a database connection. Okay, and then, you know, and give, do this for me and do that for me. And then uh, I'm kind of talking generically here because you have to break it down into, well, what it, was it? Is it a beam that it's accessing? Is it a, you know, is it a component from the servlet environment? Is it this or that? Um, but if we break it out down, we put it into a execute once, serve up to everybody. So we make one instance and we manage it. And that's the same thing, when, same way that RMI works, the same way the servlets work, same way the Java beans work. We have one Java bean that gets created. What's a Java bean? Well, it's a small program. <laughs> it's not a full-fledged application. It's a small little piece of a program. Actually, it is a program. They call it a bean because it's small. Small little program written in Java, and all of this stuff is written in Java. Even RMI is completely Java. And... Uh, the bean performs some bit of functionality. It's like a worker bee. So the bean gets called, and maybe it's a bean that's associated with the database server, and it establishes the connection to the server, or it's managing the connection with the server that's already established. You're going through, and you're using that same object over and over again. It makes Beans make for efficiency, because you don't have to reinvent the wheel with each new request for a service or for a functionality. The bean object is already in existence, already instantiated. You just call it, and it does, and it retreats back the information that you want. So, uh, so JSP is a Java server pages by definition, which allows embedded Java calls, similar to PHP, 
if you've ever worked with PHP, uh, used for presentation layer, because uh, it can uh, it can take and work with HT HTML. So I was going to say HTTP, but it does it works over HTTP, but it works with HTML in terms of the mockup. If you have a little HTML background, that's great. If you're not a huge HTML fan, I don't understand why. <laughs> it's pretty easy. It's a mockup language, but it's used a lot with J JSP in terms of and same PHP. Can't get a can't get away from HTML. So it's hard, and it's hard to use a GUI editor to create a HTML page that's going to work with a JSP script or with a PHP script. Now that would be the scripting language. Here's the bean I was talking about, the EJB. So the enterprise Java bean that provides the business logic, you know, the database connectivity, sharing of resources between many different applications. So if you had a bean, going back to my example with the database, if you had a bean that was managing the connection to the database, instead of going to the database and requesting a connection, you go to the bean. <laughs> the bean serves up the database to all of the applications that need to connect to it saves down, saves on the resources on the database end, and it's a worker bee, going back to that concept. And hopefully you understand what I'm saying when I say worker bee. You guys know about bees. They sting, they bite. <laughs> bees are very productive, and so are beans. You know, Bees go around and they pick up stuff and they take it over here and take it over there. Kind of like ants. Ants are very productive people. I shouldn't say people. Organs. Or, or ants are, I guess, that are Anyway, <laughs> slight tangent. RMI. Uh, RMI allows separate Java applications or layers to communicate with each other. So it's a level above sockets. Yeah, that's not, that definition is not doing it justice. I'll talk about RMI as we go through the course. We'll have a couple weeks on RMI and you'll write an RMI application. And uh, all of this stuff can be written in uh, Eclipse, which will simulate and work with Apache, actually. That's what, probably the server that we're going to end up using for this course. JMS, Java Messaging, newer, well, I shouldn't say the most, it is, probably still is the newest, the newer technology of J2EE providing publish, subscribe, point-to-point -point framework communication, it's a messaging system, message response uh, type system. Those actually, those last two slides here within the next 15 weeks, these are the technologies that we're hitting one by one, which is what the theme of this particular course is about. So if you're wondering, what are we going to cover in this course? These two slides. <laughs> That's what we're covering. There's others. As I mentioned before, there's ASP that looks like, works like, acts like JSP. You know, it's the same thing. Java's not like reinvented. And Java's not like the brand newest everything possible. Although there are some things that exist in Java that don't exist in other languages. Visual Basic does a good job. C++ does a good job. Some of the stuff, the .NET platform does a good job at networking stuff. Pascal, Prolog. Some of these things do scripting like, scripting tools. Some of these do database connectivity. Some of them do middleware connectivity components like .NET. You can compare .NET to any of this stuff as a direct comparison between what, what the technology is actually doing. The difference is and especially for web applications would be portability. <laughs> .NET is, unless you're on a Microsoft server and you're working with Microsoft computers and you have a Microsoft operating system on your client, you're not working very much outside of the .NET. You know, you're, you're on .NET. So Java is a little bit more widespread in terms of flexibility. As I mentioned before, I can do your homework assignments on a MacBook. You can do them on a Windows machine. You can do them on a Linux machine. doesn't matter. All works the same. That's kind of important for web application. Um, also, it's kind of important for server connectivity. Microsoft servers are kind of hard to communicate with. Apache servers, open source servers, Linux-based servers, a lot easier to configure, a lot easier. You have more options in terms of your servers purchasing them. We have one standard, not various different flavors either. Java is Java. So all of the different components are written in the same programming language. So .NET, as an example, you want to do, you want to do ASP. Well, you got to learn Visual. That's Visual Basic, really. Visual Basic ASP.NET. Well, it's not really Visual Basic, but it's very Visual Basic-ish <laughs> in terms of how it falls into the Visual Studio. You're talking about learning and doing something in ASP. 
you know, which is different than, let's say, C++, which is different than C, which is, you know, so you have a lot more languages to learn, which is a lot, a lot why a lot of people take the Java route, because it's one language. And once you learn it, you can program all of these different components in the same language. Deployable on all leading web app servers. As I mentioned before, you're not stuck with just Microsoft servers. Minimal modifications needed uh, when you change the servers. So you can upgrade, put it on different servers. Java has also defined a standard API protocol for server communications as well. So why use Java as a programming language for this? It provides a single technology for the enterprise environment combined. Uh, compared to combining other applications, as I mentioned before, this is sort of a repeat. So we don't have to worry about learning all of the different sub-applications in the programming environments. So a little tech review for the first day, and just kind of get you up on speed. And you should be familiar with most of these terms. If you're not, then it's probably not the right course, because the assumption is you know what, it's on a client. And you're familiar with the concept of the client. The client is primarily the HTML interface through web browsers. Applet's not so important anymore. In fact, I don't know, I suspect applets probably aren't going to be supported. Well, maybe you give it another five, ten years, maybe. There's a lot, some people like applets. They make like, like little, mo, you know, little mortgage calculators and stuff. Little, little stuff. Can't run a really big application in an applet. The customer would pretty much disconnect from your site before the applet finished downloading. <laughs> it's going to take too long. Giving you the impression that applets are kind of slow because of that download time. It runs on the client. Other technologies running on the client are Java applications. So a lot of the applications that you install, especially in uh, mobile devices, actually aren't really running on your device. You installed it, it created the client interface, and most of the stuff is running on a server. And it relies on that internet connection, and which is great, uh, especially now that we can depend on internet connections. So in the old days, prior to, you know, prior to the expansion of the internet, not everybody, and most people had dial-up connections, but not everybody had a constant connection. How are you going to run applications without a constant connection? So as we get into, let's say, cloud environments, where your application is on a cloud, and you're knowing you don't even have it on your client, you've really made a 360-degree jump switch between the old days of everything. You know when you went to the store and you bought software? You know, and you put a disk in and you installed it? You can't even do that anymore. But... Now you don't even put anything on your client. You just buy it, take it out of the box, turn it on, and you have all your applications and everything, you know, just like your old computer was, you know, which allows flexibility in clients as well. So, uh, Visual Basic, C++, Dell 5, DBScript, PHP, cool. these are all what I'd call client-side applications. Compared to web servers, the web server category, we've got a little bit of combination. We have HTML on a web server. We have HTML on a client. So basically telling you it can be used in both both locations. This is just basically giving you location specific stuff. If you're going to use C, you're going to go through CGI. Perl is a server application. PHP is server. ASP is server. JSP is server. Servlets, Gold Vision, these are all server. Or web servers, web services. In terms of databases, you want to be familiar with the concept, and this is things that, you know, on this tech review, it's like, if the list looks a little different, go ahead and do a Google search uh, on some of the concepts and familiarize yourself with the technologies. You don't really need to know that much about them at this point. Uh, in terms of databases, we're looking at relational tables. I'm not going to get into object-oriented databases in this course because they're a little bit untested at this point. Uh, shouldn't say untested. They're not mainstream enough to be implemented widespread right now. Uh, we're still working in a relational world. The primary keys, foreign keys, database schemes, operations for SQL, so transaction blocks. And uh, the concept of the transaction, as a side note, is really kind of uh, one of the things that we'll look at. Because transactions is normally, well, when we think about transactions, a lot of people would think about databases. Because in order for a transaction to occur, let's say, a banking application, and this is a withdrawal, let's say, you always think about, oh, the withdrawal transaction. But there might be multiple queries involved with that, multiple updates and multiple steps. 
and we start talking about RMI and servlets and stuff, we have to actually start thinking about transactions again because this piece of information goes here and that piece goes over there and then you want to make sure it all completes before the transaction, you know, in order before the transaction is considered successful. Because if only part of it completes and the other part doesn't complete, you've got a problem. So a lot of the uh, servlet, in fact, RMI has a transaction manager that's associated with it that will keep track of, and it's a, well, it's a session manager, but also a transaction-oriented manager that where you can define certain events, certain things, and configure it so that you can basically air check, and make sure that things are actually performing correctly. So what I just ran through a few minutes ago, and I'll just go for one more. This slide set is like about 78 slides. I'm not going to go all of it today. But I'm going to hit this next section uh, just so that we can feel like we've covered something today. First section was uh, ba really basically on the course, you know, an introduction to Java EE. The second one is on client, server, and distributed systems. So knowing the differences between them is kind of an essential thing to walk in on the first day to kind of at least know what you're working with terms of the enterprise. So distributed systems by definition, one in which components are located at networked computer computers and they communicate and coordinate their activities by passing messages. Well that's kinda kinda broad if you think about it. If anything, everybody's distributed. <laughs> um so the more modern day definition of that is distributing work. If you talk about the Linux system, we have distributed uh, CPU power. You know, we've got a bunch of, you know, maybe a bunch, maybe five servers connected together, and we got 20 people connected to these five servers. Multiple people are holding multiple sessions on different servers. You know, one guy over here who's connected to this server can borrow resource power from that other server over there to do some number crunching, they have foreground, background jobs, and stuff like that. And what we're doing is we're distributing the processing power among five different computers and servicing up 20 different customers or 20 different clients. That's truly a distributed kind of environment. But the dis word distributed in that sense is used by, uh, defined by, you know, distributing work, distributing manpower. In the more modern day and used in a Java sense, it is really sending messages back and forth <laughs> because We've distributed out the application over an application server, a web server, a database server. We have to communicate between the different servers. So a lot of the distributed management is with the communication protocols. You know, make sure that the right messages are being sent and received between the different components to create that distributed environment, so to speak. So don't think of this more like the traditional Unix sense and distributing CPU power and hard disk space and stuff, although those concepts still kind of apply. So most enterprise web applications fall under the umbrella of distributed services. It's a, it's a big umbrella. <laughs> so, so what do we have in terms of distributed systems consequences? We know about all the good stuff that distribute. We all know about all the stuff that the Internet provides. And the Internet is the best example I can come up with for a distributed system. Uh, our experiences as consumers on the internet, we would never think about how many different servers we're actually connecting to on a particular day. But it, I would, you know, guess to say, depending upon the nature of your activities, you're probably connecting to at least five, at least six. I mean, that's after you just check email, <laughs> or maybe went into the LMS or went into the uh, website or something. You know, every every time you hit something new, you're going to a different server. Some of the things we have to think about, and these are things that are built into the Java EE toolkit and some of the stuff that we'll be configuring throughout the course is the concept of concurrency, multiple, supporting multiple simultaneous clients connected. So working uh, work is happening at the same time on different computers and sharing resources between the different computers and also between the different clients. Because we have concurrent clients, we have concurrent applications now, all supporting uh, the concurrency concept. Another kind of interesting thing that nobody really thinks about is this global clock. You know, especially if you've got even in the US you can go from, you know, three hour time difference, actually. I think it's like six hours, no, three or four hours if you go to Hawaii. You've got another couple hours. I think it's five hours. What's the time difference between California and Hawaii? Three or it's like the East Coast? Three hours. But if you're that's between California and Hawaii, but if it's between California Hawaii and the East Coast, it's six hours. 
So, but you have servers located all over the world, because not everyone's going to be located in the same state or the same area. And so now you have to figure out, well, how are we going to sync the, between the transactions and the timestamps of th certain things? How are we going to sync the clocks between all these different servers? So all computers on the network that do not share the same clock or time, the notion of correct time, that's an interesting one that has to be built into the architecture, you know, in terms of the distributed environment. What about independent failures? This happens all the time. Well, we have fault tolerance to think about in terms of the network. Uh, results in isolation of computers that are connected to it. So each component uh, can fail independently. Maybe we have duplicate things. Have you ever gone to Google and never gotten a connection? No. You know how many Google servers there are out there? <laughs> you know how many of them go down probably on a daily basis? Uh, probably, I don't know how many go down, but I've worked with servers before, and I know they get to a certain age, and then they just fail and fail and fail until you replace them. Uh, so, long story short, you'd never know as a consumer that they have failing servers occasionally. Because you just get routed to another one. Right to another one. And the application itself is housed on many different groups of servers or server farms that are all supporting it. You have more clients that are connecting, you're growing, you just add more servers to it. <laughs> all of a sudden you can you can service a lot more clients. And the motivation to construct a distributed system. Well, you have to have the desire to share resources in the motivation. So as the nature of computing is changing and we're sharing resources and we're becoming more enterprise oriented, then that becomes a possibility in terms of the application development environment. It becomes something we want. Here's some examples if you've never heard of a distributed system. I keep mentioning it. The internet is the only biggest example I can come up with. Email, file transfer, www, firewalls, routers, servers. The intranet is actually a distributed system as well, mobile and ambiguous computing. Actually, you can have um, a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer applications for file sharing are distributed systems, if you think about it, because each one of us, each one of the peers is holding something another peer is going to get. You've distributed out the information among a bunch of different peers. So, handheld devices, mobile phones, smartphones, watches, smart applicants, appliances might be distributed. You could put a distributed system into your house, I guess, you know, all your appliances, your TV, your, your computers, your cell phones, your PDAs, everything is all connected together. So here's the typical portion of the internet where we've got ISPs connected to intranets, perhaps, and then we've got uh, more clients that are connected. So we have desktop computers, servers, and we have network lines that are connected. This is actually you know, a better example, actually. Backbone connections, you know, satellite links, things. Putting together, uh, actually, the incorporation of uh, voice over IP is actually kind of an interesting technology, if you think about it. Because now we have, uh, if this network already exists, then we should be able to get to any location in the world. Why not put the telephone communications over it, over IP? So. IP, if you're not familiar with the word, stands for Internet Protocol. <laughs> voice over IP is running voice over data, Internet Protocol. Uh, your typical intranet inside of a company, email. So see, you, you, now you're looking at the distributed environment, essentially. You've got email servers, you've got firewalls, routers, gateways, web servers. Uh, print and other types of services that are connected to locals with client connections that are all connected to other client connections. So this is actually referred to as IT infrastructure for most companies. So and the IT people are controlling the infrastructure, the typical uh, communication. Portable and handheld devices in the distributed system, well they also they have a WAP gateway for mobile phone devices going into the internet, maybe a home internet going into the internet host intranet going into the internet. Wireless LAN, not all of this is wired. Most of the connections are wireless. And as the interesting thing is, is as we bring on more wireless, you can kind of see, uh, you can kind of see bottlenecks in the system. Because if you take these connections, I probably could go back to a different slide actually, and you measure the connectivity speed between everything, you know, this is not fair. <laughs> Just like the city roads aren't fair. Some roads are more used than other roads. And there's congestion on the roads and stuff. 
So what, you know, if the government did take over the internet, going back to my censorship, one of the good things that might actually come in, no, there's a lot of bad that would happen with that, but one of the good things is they might be able to actually control the speed and the support for the weakest links, hopefully. I don't know. You would think, but I seriously doubt that would ever be an objective for them. <laughs> I think they're primarily concerned with uh, making it, cleaning it up, making it rated PG and cleaning up and regulating and charging for e-commerce and stuff like that, which is just not really that good. So. Uh, web servers and web browsers, how do they fit into the picture? Here's Google, here's W3C, some other stuff coming in. We have the suite of protocols that are supporting it. Activity at HTML, uh, as an example, that might be coming out of a, you know, looking at uh, protocols for the con connectivity into this blanket we're calling the internet. And then on the other side, on the client side, we've got web browsers that are connecting through it. So, challenges of the distributed systems. So let's go back because these environments are where we're building the applications in. Whether we're going from an intranet through the internet, using some back-end server with a front-end server, whether we're connecting clients together, or whether we're using wireless, whether we're using you know, one server to connect to another server. One of the interesting problems is the heterogeneity of uh, not everybody's the same. <laughs> it's not a, it's a very different. So there's a variety of uh, difference as applied to not only, as I mentioned before, the network speeds, but the technology. Is it wired, wireless, DSL, high speed, low speed, cable? Where is it coming from? A cellular, internet, cellular data. Computer hardware also changes operating systems are different. Programming languages are different implementations by different developers, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so not every developer has the same security notion in mind or something of that nature. Which comes out and kind of lends itself nicely to this middleware solution. A lot of people consider the EE environment, well, a lot of people would call .NET middleware. Corba gets labeled middleware. Um, Java EE sort of, RMI gets labeled middleware in a lot of ways. Uh, what is middleware? It's a layer. You can stick on top of everything else. Java essentially is middleware, if you think about it, the JVM. It's a software layer that provides programming abstraction as well as masking uh, heterogeneity of the underlying networks makes, makes them all the same. Uh, so we've got the hardware, the operating systems, the programming languages that all work together. And that's where we get the common object request broker, a CORBA. And that's where we get RMI, the Java Remote Invocation. So we're going to cover both of these technologies later in the course. Uh, RMI only supports uh, Java, uh, so only supports a single programming language. Corba actually supports more than just Java, so it's a little bit more flexible in terms of using it with other environments. But a lot of people have gone the RMI route, actually, because it is native to Java and works a lot faster, actually. So, But I will cover that for a discussion later. And then mobile code, so code that's sent from one computer to another to run on a destination, so Java applets and stuff like that. We also have problems with, or challenges with, I should call them problems, with openness. Making things, well, it's something that's not open source, making it open source, essentially. Making it, and Java is an open source environment. All the tools are free. All the environment is open. Open for development, expansion, but also open for weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So determining whether the system can be extended and implementing it in various different ways. Degrees to which new resources sharing and services can be added and made available through different uh, programs. So. How much openness do you, are you going to put in there? And if you're going to make it completely open, then you're limited to some extent by what you can do, what you can't do. Open distributed systems, that's a new, I shouldn't say new, it's a reoccurring buzzword. It's open distributed system. It means it's, it's expandable and it's distributed. So you have a key interfaces that are published, that are made available, that are distributed, and you have uniform communication mechanisms publishing the interfaces and the shared resources. There's a centralized library domain system. If you think about it, named, naming, domain name system is an open distributed system. Everybody shares it. If I, got, if I have a bhacker.com, you know, <laughs> I don't have to tell every server about it. They go to the open distributed database lookup and they go, oh, that's at 192.1. You know, <laughs> gives me the IP address lookup. 
that's one of the goals of making our challenges, is how do you distribute it, the information, and how do you make it so it's easily looked up and found. So, constructed, uh, hmm, taking heterogeneous hardware and software from different vendors and conforming to a public standard. So, don't have to tell you that security is a challenge. In fact, uh, that's one of the selling points of the Java EE environment is the added security, the added bonus that you get to it. Well, information resources for highly intrinsic values to users. Well, that sounds like a sales pitch. Security is of vital importance. Well, that's a sales pitch too, vitally important. Uh, well, most have confidentiality, protection against disclosure, unauthorized individuals, login, stuff like that. Um, integrity, availability, different things um, associated with security that the Java environment sort of provides a little bit of. If actually, it provides more this more so than some other non-security oriented platforms. So, scalability is the big one, big challenge. How do you make it grow, and how do you make it shrink? Especially when you're dealing with tiering, do you have this whole tier and you're only using a little bit of it? <laughs> it's like hardly ever used. You know, can you move it? Uh, which is one of the interesting things. You can build an entire RMI server, RMI application server, all in one computer if you wanted to. So. The flexibility in terms of where are you storing these tiers, you can mimic the entire tiering system on one computer or one server if you wanted to, uh, and then grow it out if you wanted to. So, by definition, however, scalability, the system is scalable if it will remain effective when there's a significant increase in the number of resources and the number of users, like the internet, which is kind of interesting. As more people connect, well, more servers get logged on, more servers get connected on there too. In terms of challenges associated with scalability, the control of costing the physical resources, uh, the cost of the physical resources, uh, excuse me, um, they're expensive. Uh, controlling the performance loss, perhaps preventing software resources from running out, avoiding performance bottlenecks. I think bottlenecks are like one of the biggest issues that still exist these days. Servers have gone down in price. Servers, you know, have become more available to lower you know, startup companies and stuff. Um, in fact, to multiple tiering on one computer is possible. But how do you get rid of bottlenecks? That's the issue. Because uh, eventually your, your application is going to have either, a, and it's usually a bottleneck going to the database, actually. <laughs> so, because depending on how many simultaneous connections you get, your, your database, if your database is the weakest link, it's controlling the speed of your application, which may not necessarily be a good thing. Failure handling is also a challenge in the distributed environment. More failure types can occur uh, in different types of uh, processes and networks than they do on single standalone computers. You've got more links between different servers and things. More pop, pop potential for failures. Uh, the failures are maybe perhaps partial. So some components work, some components don't. So it's hard to tell where the failure is coming from. Actually, in terms of networking, Trying to find failures in a distributed environment is a lot more challenging, especially if it is in a client server. Either their server's not running, or one of the clients isn't running. <laughs> so, in a distributed environment, who knows what's not running? Because half of it's working and half of it's not working. So, it's kind of a challenge. Techniques for handling failures, detecting failures, using, well, that's kind of an old fashioned technique using a checksum, but uh, masking the failures. You know, Retransmitting dropped messages, perhaps, if the failure does occur. Tolerating it. You know, just keep trying. Just keep rebooting. That's kind of like the Windows failures. Uh, recovery from failures, rollbacks, stuff like that. Redundancy in terms of hardware and stuff. In terms of concurrency, I already mentioned kind of, but just as a side comment to add to it, several clients attempt to access a shared resource at the same time, we're looking at not necessarily concurrency in terms of applications running, but clients running. And then program threads. We don't want threads. Well, we, we, we want threads, but we don't want too many threads. So the problem is just controlling the concurrency of the threads, and what consumers are actually doing, what customers are actually doing on the server. Distributed software must be responsible for ensuring that the server and the applications operate correctly in a concurrent environment. Transparency. This is actually kind of an interesting challenge that we don't really think about unless we go into the distributed environment. It's kind of common in that client server to know you're connecting to a server, <laughs> to know 
in a distributed environment, you don't want there to be any kind of notion that you're connecting to somebody else. It's integrated all together as if it were one application running on one computer or one server, and that's what transparency is meaning. So you're concealing from the user and the application programmers and everybody of the separation of all these different components in the distributed system. You get a lot of transparency in the Unix environment, actually. A lot of users think they have their own dedicated computer. That's how you should think. Who knows that the backups and all the system reports and everything's being run on your computer <laughs> while you're using it. You realize that when the, uh, this happens all the time, it used to happen all the time, actually, when people put the boxes, put the server box on the desk or next to the desk. At the end of the night, you know, the receptionist who's using that computer during the day shuts it off because <laughs> they think it's a PC and they just shut it off. And they go, well, how come the backups are failing? How come this is, and everything stops working because someone shut the server off? <laughs> they thought it was their own personal computer, which is kind of interesting, actually. It still happens today. And so then you get around that by hiding the boxes. Don't put it at the desk. You just got this little terminal and it's networked, wired through the wall. <laughs> so she can't shut it off or he can't shut it off. So. All right, so the system is perceived as a whole rather than as a collection of independent components. And a programmer is only concerned with the design of their own particular application or their own component. Transparency forms, and this is something that we'll look at, especially when we start building distributed applications in this course, uh, a couple of different forms of transparency, one being access transparency. Enables local, remote, and everybody to have identical operations. In fact, we see this a lot in multi-platform development these days where we have mobile devices, cell phones, tablets, computers, PCs, all sorts of different iPads, all sorts of different things connecting to the same server. Access transparency would make it the interface look the same regardless of who the client was or where they were coming from. The access all looks the same. Uh, location transparency, that's an interesting one. It enables resources to be accessed without knowledge of their physical or network location. So, for example, uh, which building or IP address, meaning, you know, if you access Google, you have a location transparency. You have no idea which server in which state you have actually connected to, which IP address. In fact, you can get the Google IP addresses and you can connect to the IP addresses if you want to. <laughs> There's people that do that for some reason, but why? Because if you use the Google load balancing through their server system, you'll get to the one that has the best speed for your particular login time you know, versus this IP address that you insist upon connecting to. But for a while, people are going, let's go to the ones in San Francisco. So they get the IP address. It's shorter, so be faster. I don't want to go to Texas. You know, I don't want to go to this other location. Well, if everyone connects to one server, it kind of defeats the purpose, really. <laughs> Concurrency transparency, not knowing that everybody is connecting to the same server simultaneously, uh, which is what concurrency is referring to. Enables several processes to operate concurrently among shared resources without the interference between them. So we know that the applications are all running together concurrently. The users are all connecting concurrently. We don't know. Also, replication transparency. This is actually becoming a lot more sophisticated. In the past, we could see you know rerouting to a different server. Okay, well that means. The server you originally went through is down, so now it's going to the backup server. Or you see a message, no. Actually, you see replication transparency is obvious on ATM machines. When the ATM machine tells you this computer is no longer deposit accepting, this terminal is no longer accepting deposits. And you're like, well, how come it can give out cash, but it can't take in cash? Because there's a, well, it's the server for which it was connected to <laughs> for the deposit functionality is down. It's not replicated. It's not being replicated. So if you had replication transparency, it could be completely down, 100%. Yet the server, the ATM would allow you to do everything as if it weren't down. And then it would somehow go to another server that would provide the same feature. So it enables multiple instances of the resource to be used to increase the reliability and the performance without the knowledge of the replicas by the user or the application programmer. So you don't know that it's going to a different server instead of that one. You, have, you don't have this rerouting or you don't have it or any of this other stuff that tells you. You get that with towers, GPS towers actually. If you, cell phones as well actually. 
if you travel a lot, you get off an airplane, all of a sudden your phone resetting, recalculating. <laughs> it like has to set correctly with the local tower because it's a different tower than the last time it was connected to. So different replica of something. Failure transparency enables you to conceal the faults. Concealment of the faults allowing users and application programmers to complete their chat tasks. Despite the failures of the hardware and the software, usually you can kind of see the failure transparencies. I see this a lot on web applications. You know, like you fill out a shopping cart, and you hit connect to buy, and all of a sudden you get sent back to another screen. Hey, what happened? And then you got to go back in because it just reset because there was a failure somehow. You know. Yeah, try to connect to the something failed, something didn't work right. So log you out. So you can log back in. Oh look, it's a car. Oh, and you hit it again, it works the second time. So that's failure transparency. And uh, not really that transparent, I guess, if you can pick it out. Who knows? Maybe it's happening and we don't know that it's happening. So mobility transparency, allowing the movement of the resources on the clients within the system without affecting the operation of the user of the program. We see that all the time actually with your cell phones, with your mobile mobile devices have mobility, transparency. Looks the same, runs the same, using different servers you know, as soon as you get off the airplane. <laughs> so, still sending and receiving correctly. So. And performance transparency allows the system to be reconfigured to improve performance as load varies. Mm, that I wish I saw more of. We don't really see performance transparency that much. Actually, I see that on my own website. The GUI goes away and I see text that shows up. I'm like, ah, internet speed's too slow. <laughs> so, it's still showing the page, but it doesn't look the same. We're missing all the GUI parts of it. Well, that would be performance transparency, sort of, but it's not very transparent that's happening. Transparency means you can't notice it. It's gone. You don't know what's happening, even though it is happening. Scaling transparency, unfortunately, we know this one too. Why does the internet? get slow and then it gets fast again and then it gets slow and it gets fast again. So as the load varies, theoretically if it, we had scaling transparency we wouldn't notice it. Just more servers would come on and all of a sudden the speed would be the same. It wouldn't drop, which was what that's allowing you to do. So it allows systems and applications to expand to the scale without changing their system structure or their application algorithms. Here's the enterprise. Big old picture wouldn't be the first day of class without showing you a picture of the enterprise. So here it is. <laughs> so, this is what we're talking about. Customers, partners, all connected together, employees over here. We got customer support, inventory management, fulfillment, HR over here. This is your, cup, this is your, your typical company. Your database is over here. They just say data on them, but you can have data associated with them. Tables. Your data could be a database, it could be a table. Hopefully it's shared in the case of joint applications. And this is the email, this little envelope here, other shared resources and applications. So what we're doing is we're building tiered, and it's tiered because it's separated out into different components. And it's the enterprise because it's everybody working together on the same shared applications. And they're all connecting in different ways. You know, partners and customers, they have different access to this whole system than the employees do, theoretically, hopefully. <laughs> For security reasons, I hope so. In terms of the framework, it's the scheme for classifying. This is kind of our summary of enterprise. I'm getting close to the end here, don't worry. Uh, so the, see people walking out already. They so, didn't get on any attendance. Okay. Uh, unless it is going around. I don't know. Anyway, so it's the scheme for classifying, organizing the topics related to managing the enterprise, assisting the organization to become more accountable and responsive. Shows how the enterprise architecture considers the design and operation of the organization from many different aspects, perspectives, and disciplines. So, uh, what I'm going to do at this point is stop, and my TA is going to remind me because now what we're going to hit is uh, what, what, what I'm going to talk about next week is I'm going to finish this lecture, and uh, the lecture goes into layering and architectures, and the architectures deserve a lot more attention in terms of like a complete lecture in its own vertical and horizontal configurations. What we're going to look at is different layering systems and the tiering concept. And we'll spend a little bit more time talking about the logical physical tiers of applications and stuff, uh, which is going to take us into two tier, three tier, multi tier, middleware, and enterprise means a little bit more in terms of that architecture and what it's providing. Um, 
object lifecycle, object instantiation, remote objects, and cover a lot of vocabulary and terminology associated with the things that we're going to be building in the course. So we'll continue this next week. And uh, that was slide number... Yeah, I really, really want to start right here. 33 is where I'm going to start next time in terms of the architectures. So the architectures are kind of interesting, actually. It won't be a complete network architecture course lecture. Well, it'll be a complete lecture on architectures, but it's not going to cover what you'd get in a full course. But uh, So thank you all for showing. And next week we will continue this lecture. And then the following week, I believe we're going to get into JDBC, actually. So we'll, we'll hit from the foundational overview into our first technology coming up within the next couple weeks. Questions? I was asked for questions and nobody ever gives them to me, but I guess I'll, I'll hear them momentarily. <laughs> so. Okay, we're all done for today. <laughs>